we have until 11.55, so I want to get um, this conversation going. Questions are going to come up, everybody. Uh, if you have questions, drop them in the chat. I'll get them to, to them at the end of the conversation. But um, Dr. Z has a lot going on. And when do you, you have to leave at like 11.55? She'll have time for questions. Uh -huh. As you can tell, she's very busy. Um, and it's really awesome that she's here to join us. And for those of you that don't know um, me, I'm Brian Chaplin, the founder of Medicine Box. Uh, I've been um, in the plant medicine world for 15 plus years. I've grown cannabis and hemp and um, psilocybin mushrooms. I'm also in recovery from drugs and alcohol. I celebrated 10 years, um, September 9th. And uh, I always say um, I'm sober, not somber. I'm not Cali sober because I don't like identifying with terminology. I'm just a human being. And I have used uh, psychedelics extensively in my own recovery process. So this conversation um, that we're about to have is uh, near and dear to my heart. And I'm very passionate about these, these topics. And it's going to be really fun hearing from Dr. Z who is a licensed family doctor specializing in natural medicine and integrative mental health. Um, in addition to seeing patients in private practice, she works internationally as a psychedelic medicine provider, speaker, and advocate. Her diverse experiences with psychedelic healing include journeys to Peru's Sacred Valley, training in MDMA-assisted therapy through MAPS, boom, boom, volunteering with groups like the Zendo Project, who's part of MAPS at Burning Man and White Bird at Oregon Country Fair, assisting at Ibogaine Treatment Centers in Mexico, working at a psilocybin center in Jamaica, and being one of the first doctors in America to present on psychedelics in a medical grand rounds. So worldly psychedelic <laughs> person here. Uh, Dr. Z is committed to educating healthcare providers and policymakers on the therapeutic value of psychedelics understanding that addiction is an illness. Addiction is an illness. Over 100,000 people died in 2021 from drug overdoses and the 100,000 more, millions more that we don't know of that suffers in isolation. Uh, she's also an advocate for supporting those with substance use disorder rather than criminalizing them. Um, people that are addicted to drugs and alcohol are humans too. Let's remember that. Uh, she is also the author of a medical literature review on the power of vitamin C to prevent and treat opioid dependency. We're going to talk about that today. And moreover, as one of the lead educators of the Psychedelic Facilitator Training Program, Inner Trek, whose founder, Tom Eckert, helped legalize psilocybin-assisted therapy in Oregon, Dr. Z is putting many of these lessons learned on the ground to shape the practices of the first state accredited psilocybin facilitators in North America, who you were teaching this weekend, right? Did I pick up on that? <laughs> All you right. Did. So that is Dr. Z in just a tiny little nutshell. Uh, it's 11 11. Let's take a deep breath and then we're going to get into questions and I'm going to give the talking stick to uh, Dr. Z. So thanks for being here. Um, we're going to get right to it and thank you all for joining. Um, it's really appreciative of people taking time out of their day. It's the most valuable asset and you get to, um, spend that with us. So, uh, on your website, uh, you mentioned that after college or uni, you wanted to go into medicine, but you didn't want to go to the mainstream route. Mm -hmm. Why was That's that? Right. I didn't feel that, that spark. Um, there is definitely power in conventional medicine and I use it as well in my practice, but it was missing. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Then I can now, it was missing soul. It was missing spirit. It was missing any kind of room for you know, even, even in the integrative medical world, we have mind, body, health. Okay, there's something hugely missing in that. And it's the soul, it's the spirit, right? There really is no mind or body without the soul. And I also know 
knew, knew then, as I know now, that while conventional medicine is very good at heroics, you know, you get your finger cut off, you don't need a homeopath. You need to go straight to the ER and get that sewn back on, right? What conventional medicine is not very good at treating is chronic illness. And as it turns out, the majority of illnesses that people in this part of the world are suffering from and dying from are actually from chronic illness. And a lot of those illnesses are created by and can be prevented by lifestyle choices, nutritional choices, and natural medicines. And so I saw there was this great big gaping hole in the medical system. Uh, and I didn't really feel called to be part of the healing in that way. So treating humans as people and not as these blobs of illness, right? Yes. On the other side of the, and taking them into the fourth dimension. <laughs> right, right. Well, and, and one, one of the principles of conventional medicine is you identify the disease and then you remove the disease. And the medical philosophy that I come from, that's part of it, but the medical philosophy is actually quite different. It's you identify the human and you treat the whole person and you turn up the dial on their vitality. And then their vitality takes care of the disease. And, so on. and when it doesn't, which it sometimes doesn't, right, then we can intervene with our heroic tools and sort of assist that process. But by putting the person at the center in less of a victimized role, uh, I find that I'm able to help people heal in a way that some of my conventional medical colleagues just, just aren't. And you're staying open-minded to that too, all the way from the very beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Without going into the the traditional Western medical route and challenging those belief systems and still navigating your way through becoming a medical professional where yeah. there's a lot of folks that have like gone through that. And then they're like, well, I'm super jaded and I was taught all the wrong things and backtracking, right. Reverse right. engineering your knowledge. So what did you say? Um, uh, turn up the vitality. I want to say that. Mm -hmm. Say that one more time. Yeah, yeah just turn up the vitality. Turn, turn up the more. dial on the vitality. Yeah. Yeah. So every one of us has a vital force. Now you can call it whatever you want to call it. You can call it inner healer, inner wisdom. In Chinese medicine, they call it chi or prana in India or ki in Japan. Rei ki. Ki mm -hmm. is talking about that same vital force. Every person, every living thing has that vital force. When you look at you look at a plant, a plant as it grows, it pushes forward, right? There's that greening energy in Latin. It's called the veritidas. It's mm -hmm. that it's that greening power. And we have that greening power too. We have that vital force as well. And so what I see my role as being as a healthcare provider is to help a person identify anything that might be blocking their vital force, remove that obstacle, and then align with things ideally in nature, but sometimes chemical if we need to, that are going to synergize with that vital force or crank up the volume on the vital force. Because what differentiates us from say cars we have mechanics too. We have parts and pieces that have functions, but what's different with us is we have a vital force, mm -hmm. which is why we have all these medical anomalies of people recovering when they weren't supposed to, right? Mm -hmm. Or people who should be responding to treatment, but aren't, and their vitality is cranked way down. So I kind of, I kind of joke like the, the Star Wars reference of like, use the force. Like when I don't know what, what to do with the patient, I just kind of think like, okay, use, use the force. How, <laughs> what's in the way of the force? What's blocking mm. it? Or what could be helping it express itself more effectively here? I like how you analogize that with nature too, which could be a whole mm -hmm. other divergent uh, conversation. Um, Dr. Ethan Russo, one of our colleagues uh, that's he studies terpenes and, and cannabis terpenes and probably like one of the uh, most knowledgeable around terpenes. Uh, he, he calls the terpenes the uh, quintessential 
uh, fifth element life force of, of mm. the plant world. That's, mm. that's his uh, phrase there. So um, at Medicine Box, one thing we always say is uh, everybody's in recovery from something. Mm. Uh, New York City, LA, uh, relationships, drugs, alcohol, uh, whatever it might be. But tell us about how you treat addiction and and what needs to change in order to get this right very sure. misunderstood so oh hugely misunderstood well i see addiction as i do virtually any disease that arises from within the organism which is it's an adaptation and there's something in medicine called maladaptive physiology meaning the organism has something challenging to work with that is a huge threat to the organism and the organism needs to respond, it needs to adapt in a way that it can continue to function despite this major challenge being there. And reaching for a substance of abuse is a very reasonable way of responding to a very challenging situation, depending on what the situation may be and depending on what tools are available self-medicating with alcohol with cannabis with opiates it may actually be an adaptation of that organism just trying to survive just trying to take care of itself in a way that it can in that moment and so what disease if we and this is where the philosophy of disease is a little different if we think of disease not as a thing that we need to destroy but rather as an attempt at a very intelligent organism to stay alive and heal, then our understanding of addiction becomes rather different. Now, no, at a certain point, it. yeah. I like how well, you humanized it all. I appreciate that from a former, and still with addictive tendencies every day. Right? Right, but humanizing it really brings it into a place of greater understanding mm -hmm. and uh, you know hum more like humble beginnings in a humble way yeah. to uh, look at it yeah and, and you know I, I will i will say i i see this often i live in portland oregon which has a very big homeless mm. population it's approaching a bit of a crisis point here and I've been in situations where we're passing encampments of homeless people and whoever I'm with has said disparaging things like, yeah, you, well, you know, you know, half of them are junkies or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I've said, you know what, if I had to live in this encampment and this was my life and I had mm -hmm. to face somebody psychologically abusing me, physically abusing me, I was always afraid that someone was going to steal my stuff or violate my body or that the police were going to come and chase me i'd be using too yeah do you, like and you know do you do you really think you could you could withstand that life without some kind of putting some kind of cushion on your nervous system i couldn't and you're hungry and you can't have a meal on a regular basis that's may, maybe using fentanyl is actually a very intelligent response to a very harsh and inhumane situation now I know that's an extreme situation, but when we when we look at substance use disorders from that lens, to me it becomes clear that there are at least two major branches we need to focus on in the treatment of substance use disorders. One is we need to interrupt the chemistry of addiction. And there is a chemical element of addiction, right? You use a substance time and time again, it changes your chemistry, right? We know, for example, opiates deplete your endocannabinoid system. So then you're going to feel pain more acutely. Mm. And then you're going to want more of your opiates because you're actually, you are physically in pain. Your body thinks it's dying, right? So we need to interrupt the chemistry happening there. Absolutely. And that's where conventional medicine hyper-focuses and does a pretty good job. And I think that's where it stops. But then there's this whole other piece of, we need to examine why this human had to adapt in such a way that they needed the substance of abuse in the first place. Was there a trauma here? Is there unstable housing? Is there ancestral trauma 
doesn't even have to be yours. Yeah. Is this person an empath and that do they just feel the pain of the world? You know, what was actually the root cause? Isolation, you know, poverty, whatever. What was actually the root cause that led this person to maladapt in this way? And I think for an addiction treatment to be successful, you've got to do both. You've got to do both. To some degree, I think psychedelics can do both. But if we really want to treat addiction, we also, as a society, have to look at how we perpetuate it as a mm -hmm. culture. That's it. Yeah. Uh, taking a full holistic uh, viewpoint from mm -hmm. the top down in bottom up from the root. Yeah. And I like what you really mentioned about uh, homeless population in, in Portland. It, it's, uh, I always say that, you know, uh, addicts are people too, and homeless yeah. people are people too, but we have such a misunderstanding and they're a lot of times they're synonymous, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people just look at like, oh, they're junkies or they're mentally ill and just brush them off but um the point that you made about you know i would want to escape from that reality too yeah right? it made me think of what Gar gabor mate says is his simple definition of addiction is just to escape from the present moment sure how many times do you know just for the audience listening you don't have to be addicted to drugs and alcohol but how many times in our day do we want to escape the present moment whether that's through our phone, social media, food, people, anything, you know, so it's a good, good tip to practice more mindfulness and awareness around where you're reaching for this external thing to escape your own present reality. So um, you started to talk about uh, the role of psychedelics and mm -hmm. addiction therapy and how can it help disrupt the dangerous habits, drug and alcohol dependent people possess? Yeah, well, if there is a mental emotional component to the root cause of the addiction, which I would argue there almost always is, a psychedelic experience, if properly integrated, can help a person get to that root. For example, trauma, experience that hasn't been properly integrated into the body or contextualized or even sometimes i have patients say to me you know i'm so ashamed that i have these problems because i never experienced a trauma you know i grew up in a loving home in a middle class family and was on you know the soccer team as a kid and okay but we all experience little t traumas right that you know, your, your best friend broke up with you when you were 14, or you never quite felt like you were smart enough for your dad. And like, he was always disappointed in you or you know, that, that, that big heartbreak, the one that got away, whatever, whatever it is, or growing up in a very religious family and then leaving the faith. We all have these little T traumas and they kick around in our psyches and they kick around in our bodies, right? and they get carried away. And so sometimes the root cause of an addiction can just be a story that like, I'm not cool and people don't like me if I'm not high. That was yeah. me. Yeah, or I have social anxiety. It's really hard for me to talk to people. And if I take a Xanax before I go to the party, I have a better time and people like me more, right? And then you do that too many times and then you've got a problem. So what psychedelics can do is and I want to be very clear that when people are using a psychedelic in a therapeutic context, they're not getting high. They are zeroing in on a very, very deep emotional and psychological process that needs to be reconciled and that needs to be focused on and healed. And so psychedelics can help people do that. They can help you forgive that parent that's already died that you won't ever get to talk to again or forgive yourself for that thing that you did when you were 15 or understand that these definitions that other people have put on you are not who you actually are. Whatever that process is, psychedelic work can be 
like a four wheel drive to what regular talk therapy might be able to accomplish in that way. And then depending on the psychedelic, it can also change your neurochemistry. So the most robust example we have of this is Ibogaine, which we know binds to opiate receptors and we know binds to a number of other receptors in the brain to interrupt the actual physiological aspects of the addiction. Because addiction, remember, has those two parts. It's that mental emotional piece, but then also your body and your chemistry gets hooked mm -hmm. as well. So you're fighting a war on two fronts. And so what I've seen happen as people go through treatment with Ibogaine is we're able to interrupt the chemistry of the addiction. And then that person is able to do a deeper psycho-spiritual deep dive into the root cause as well. And you just can't do that with methadone. You just can't. It's not what that drug does. The, the warm, fuzzy blanket of yeah. methadone. Mm -hmm. Which I want to say is the right choice for some patients, mm -hmm. right? For some people. And the only access for yeah. some patients. So, yeah. Good kind of four wheel drive into the role of vitamin C. Oh, in, yeah. And treating opioid use disorders. Mm -hmm. Walk us through that for a little while on how you would work with a, a client. Or yeah. in this. So first I want to say this is, I know that when people talk about vitamin C being able to treat anything, this is where like kind of the quack watch meter turns on for some folks. And I want to say, I know, I get it. And so when I first heard about this, I was like, Right. And it feeds the children and cleans the kitchen sink and makes Julian fries. Right. We've heard it about vitamin C. <clears throat> but then after a couple more exposures to the idea and a couple of papers and then hearing about it at uh, a conference, I was like, all right, let's look at the literature here. And something interesting about vitamin C is that almost every mammal on this planet can make its own vitamin C in its body. Your cat can synthesize vitamin C in his body. Your dog can synthesize her own vitamin C. Humans and other primates, bats and guinea pigs cannot. I don't know why. So this is what we have in common with guinea pigs and bats. We can't make our own vitamin C. We have to get it from the outside. Vitamin C is used in a number of different places in the body, but one place where it's very highly concentrated is in the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands sit on top of the kidneys. These are the glands that put, on, put out cortisol, which is your stress hormone. They also put out DHEA, which your body then turns into your sex hormones. So these are very important glands. The typical person living in our modern day world has very stressed adrenal glands. Because if these are the glands that help your body cope with stress, what do we have a lot of in our culture? We have a lot of stress. And our ancestors used to only get stress in these big bursts that would then stop. For example, life is good, you're picking berries, uh, you're you know, hunter gathering, right? And then all of a sudden you look up and oh my gosh, there's a grizzly bear, right? And then your body gets this huge flood of cortisol and it gets ready to run away from the grizzly bear or fight it or play dead, right? You go away, you get to safety, and then your body regulates. We get that now in different forms, but also what we have is constant low grade, never get a break from it stress in our society. Our bodies haven't evolved to be able to keep up with that quite yet. And so the adrenal glands become very stressed. They need more resources. They need more rest ultimately, but they burn through vitamin C in that process. And so what we see when animals, for example, when rats, when they're under high periods of stress or when they're sick, their adrenal, their bodies pump out more vitamin C. Their bodies make more vitamin C to help them deal with that. And so by extension, we might be able to argue that when our bodies are stressed, and by the way, pain is a major stressor, that our body's demands for vitamin C likewise might also increase. And so there, there have been a, a couple of studies now showing that, uh, for example, people who are going in for surgery, surgeries that typically require opiate pain medication on the back end, that if the patients take vitamin C before they go into surgery, 
which by the way, one study, it was just two grams of vitamin C by mouth one hour before going into the procedure. That the people's requirements for opiates after the surgery are cut in half. So you're less likely to have severe pain and you're less likely to need opiates. And when you do need opiates, you can take a lower dose for a shorter amount of time to manage the pain. So we've got that data. Then we have other data, which I, I will name is not peer reviewed, you know, medical journal published. And we'll talk about the challenges of that in a moment, but essentially showing that taking very high doses of vitamin C on a consistent basis, like I'm talking every two hours that you're awake, taking a big dose of vitamin C can help people who are either tapering off of opiates or quitting cold turkey to have a less bumpy experience as they transition off. And one challenge to doing research in this way, I will say I'm not a researcher, but I am an Aries, I'm stubborn. And so I'm just, you know, I was like, there's not enough research, I'm gonna do some. <laughs> and then I started reaching out to people at institutions who actually do research. The challenge is getting funding. To get funding for vitamin C research, it's Crazy not gonna time. happen. It's not going to happen because no one's no one's going to make well no one's going to make money yeah. vitamin c is dirt cheap and it's generic no one's going to make money on a study that shows that vitamin c might help people kick fentanyl or kick heroin right so we're at somewhat of an impasse so that that means we have to rely a lot on anecdotal evidence which is evidence right but it's not the gold standard in our conventional scientific realm so you know what i do with folks who want to quit is i say just do it you there's actually no risk in doing this the risk is your immune system will function better and you'll be less likely to get a cold um there is a small risk of kidney stone in men um but that's with long long-term use you know from for doing an, an acute tapering protocol you know i'm not gonna wood i've never seen it happen or heard of it happening um, but yeah, as it turns out, our bodies need, our bodies need nutrition, right? And people who are who using, right? And people who have substance use disorder typically have a number of nutritional deficiencies. Mm -hmm. And when your body doesn't have nutrition, it doesn't function properly. It cannot cope with stress as well. When you cannot cope with stress as well, you need to reach for something that will help you cope with the stress. The fastest thing that you've got in your toolkit is your drug of choice yep whether that is fentanyl cocaine tequila or instagram mm -hmm. or vitamin c so mm -hmm. yeah uh, thank you for doing that and understanding that there is anecdotal evidence out there and experience-based wellness and not just science 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 right right <laughs> So blending, blending both is really important. So um, I wanted to talk a bit about microdosing too, while we're on the, mm -hmm. on this conversation. Um, mm -hmm. What, what would you, you know, tell a patient who decided they were going to do it? Does it have a place in addiction therapy in your opinion? Sure. Or, you know, the sure. science behind it. Sure. And just to be clear, when we're talking about microdosing, we're talking about psilocybin and LSD, yeah, right? For, okay. Yeah. For this. The time for this sake of this conversation let's for this conversation yeah. <clears throat> yeah so talking with the person identifying what their goals are and identifying how they're wired so i will say that people who are prone to a generalized anxiety they sometimes feel more anxious and more agitated when they microdose and if that happens you stop it's okay you know so i always say just try it if you find that you're feeling more edgy either cut the dose in half or stop entirely. What I have found in my practice, and again, with microdosing, we're going a lot on anecdotal evidence because government is not gonna give clearance to do a study on a substance that they have said is a schedule one drug and has no medical value whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And a microdosing study to have someone come back to the office to take their dose, you know, every other day or four days on it's it's just a little clunkier to design so most of the data we have again is anecdotal what i've seen in my own practice 
is that not every patient, but enough patients come back and say, you know, when I microdose, I'm just like not as interested in alcohol. Like, I just don't even want mm. that glass of wine after the kids go to bed. Or like, you know, when I'm microdosing, like, and I come home at the end of the day, like, I, I don't really, I don't really want to smoke weed. I just don't need it, you know. Um, so it seems to just be an equilib, you know, equilibrate people when they microdose. The other thing I've seen microdosing be helpful for, again, not all the time, but in some people is with focus and attention. And the overlap between ADD, ADHD and addiction, that's a thing. That's for real. That's mm -hmm. for real, right? And so this is where, and I, and I just got to say full disclosure, yes, I practice integrative medicine. I am also trained in conventional medicine. Sometimes putting somebody on an ADD drug is like the best thing you can do for them and for their addiction. Because if you get that piece kind of locked in, that kind of fidgety impulsivity that like, ah, I got to reach for something, got to do, do for something, that can quiet down. And sometimes microdosing can very well take the place of an Intuniv or a Guanfacine or Adderall or, or Ritalin, depending on how that person's wired. Mm. Now, surprise, surprise, all of this works better if the person's nutritional status is dialed in. So guess what else I think pairs well with microdosing? It's vitamin C. Vitamin C. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and not just vitamin C, but it's like, the thing you can find at any pharmacy for under twenty dollars. You know, it's when in doubt, when in doubt, antioxidants that the adrenal glands need, right? Vitamin C. Yeah. Mm. Well, back in the the day, you know, my my parents' day with mm -hmm. uh, the sixties, you know, vitamin C and orange sunshine, LSD went really well together. There you go. But, um, there you go. I don't mm -hmm. know if they were on the nutritional. <laughs> Uh, I'm a big fan of microdosing and I like the, is a gentle amplifier, right? And like mm -hmm. the focus and the, it can help with the focus and concentration. I call that like the byproducts of, you know, of the uh, therapeutic value you can get from it, but really just quieting the, the noisy mind and, mm -hmm. you know, harm, harm reduction. You know, I, I hear that all the time too. Like I'm drinking less. So I'm, I'm not smoking cigarettes anymore, or I don't want to smoke weed um, or people are sleeping better. And uh, mm -hmm. I've been asked like, what does it help you sleep? And my only anecdotal hypothesis behind that is it really forces you to be in the present moment. Mm -hmm. And the more you're in the present moment with yourself, you're not um, tending to reach for the external to fill emptiness or you're not ruminating on thoughts and creating self-perceived anxieties which can help you sleep better so that so, that's my hypothesis just take it in the morning though. At, at least I think <laughs> it is. yeah um <laughs> let's see let's do a time check here so it's 11 41 um oh, we're good. i think we can can, can i yeah. um I, I would like to add also that i sometimes uh prescribe microdoses of ketamine to my patients mm -hmm. as well um, and I find that microdosing ketamine works almost like an antidepressant or like a, an anxiolytic. So almost like a, a Prozac or Cymbalta for, for some people in, especially people who are kind of prone to this low, low grade, like generalized anxiety picture. So like maybe the people who have tried microdosing LSD or psilocybin, which by the way, if you microdose and feel like you drank too much coffee, the dose is too high. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't microdose. It just means cut the dose back. Yep. But for, for the people who just, they've played around with the dosage and either does nothing or makes them more anxious, uh, microdose of ketamine can, can really, it's, al it's almost like taking a nail file to like the sharp talons <laughs> of, of, the, uh, of the agitation that can come with cravings and the underlying anxiety. And it has similar neurogenesis benefits to the psilocybin and the LSD. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's a reason there are so many substances on this great big planet. It's that some are gonna work really well for some people and others not so much. And right. nobody, nobody likes to hear this, but here's the thing about 
psychiatry is that it's a guess and check process. You just try something and see if yep. it works. If it doesn't work, you try something else. And, and you do kind of have to just be committed to like, no, I'm just going to keep showing up for myself until I find the thing that works. Experimentation. Mm -hmm. There's going to be something that works. Right. With intention too. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you were saying, uh, you know, the microdosing of ketamine, whole other topic of conversation, but um, mm -hmm. a, a lot of my friends are macro dosers of ketamine daily, yeah. right? Oh, it helps well. with my anxiety. I'm like, ah. Right. You probably well, like give yourself anxiety because you have a dependency on daily ketamine use. Oh yeah. And that's, that's a hard one to treat. Yeah. Too. But it is possible. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, at, at one point um, there was a dispute regarding the role of microdosing in Oregon mm -hmm. healing centers. And what is the mm -hmm. status of microdosing in Oregon PAT at the moment? Mm -hmm where should it be? Sure. Well, where, where it is as of this moment is the Oregon Health Authority has deemed microdosing to be psilocybin service that can only happen at a psilocybin service center. Now, what they have done is there is a minimum amount of time that you need to spend at the service center after you ingest the psilocybin product. And that amount of time varies depending on how much you've taken. So if you've taken a microdose, you only need to stay at the service center for an hour. I still think that's a crazy long time <laughs> for a an microdose. Hour? An hour. So that's if you're... Get, get on right. with it. Let's go. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> so um, what I think that will happen is that we will start maybe seeing microdosing centers pop up, perhaps like um, pairing it with like a meditation course or um, a Tai Chi class or something like that, where you come, you take your microdose, you participate in your class, or maybe even like a co-working space. Like pe people are going to have to get creative, but they will, they'll get creative. Big brain um, that. Which one? Uh, microdosing and then doing some breath work or meditation mm -hmm. or my Qigong or even just playing my guitar. Right. Just right. like synergizing it with some other like home behavioral exercises with another behavioral exercise to really amplify the experience instead of like, oh, I'm going to take this and then, okay, come on, focus, come on, creativity, come on, motivation. Right. right? So I like that being creative. Um, mm -hmm. And you speak, you, you mentioned healing centers uh, at Intertrek. How are you teaching facilitators? to work with addiction and, and healing centers and two part yeah. question mm -hmm. and just to keep it moving. Um, what are the ways in which psychedelics can be misused and what's the best way to guard against it? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Great questions. Well, <clears throat> I want to say psychedelics are very powerful and they're not a panacea. So psychedelics can be a huge vehicle for spiritual bypass work. And we see that a lot in the space. Psychedelics can also be amplifiers of certain personality disorders, in particular, borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder. And this is why there are so many narcissists in this field. This field seems to magnetize <laughs> narcissists. Um, yeah. And uh, which is not to say that there isn't a place for those individuals in society and that they can't be healed, but those are people who need to be monitored very closely if they're working with psychedelics and especially if they want to step into leadership positions within the psychedelic world. In terms of training our students, something very cool and challenging about the Oregon model is that to become a psilocybin facilitator, you do not have to be a licensed healthcare provider. You don't have to be a therapist. You don't have to be a doctor. You don't have to be a social worker. You don't even have to have a degree from college. You need to have high school diploma or GD equivalent to qualify for a program. 
And so we need to be very mindful in how we are teaching our students to keep reminding them, hey, you're not therapists. You're holding space for psilocybin experience, and you've got to know where your skill set ends and when it's time to refer that person onward. So working with addiction, looking at addiction, again, as a maladaptation of an intelligent orga organism that is trying to survive and heal itself, that's how we should be looking at anyone who walks in the door. What differs then is the kind of support system that we gather to help that person in addition to their psilocybin experience. Do they have a prescriber who's on their healthcare team? Do they have a therapist? Are they part of a group? Are they working a program? Doesn't have to be a 12-step program, but it certainly can be. Um, and yes, you can combine 12-step with psychedelics and one of the founders of AA used psychedelics himself, right? W loved LSD. Right? He, he also loved niacin. He did. Another, yeah. Yeah, for an, antidepressant. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for alcohol cravings. Before, so like before his time, you know, I mean, like that yeah. was like in the mid 50s. Yeah. He was experimenting with all that. Yeah. You and know there what? is psychedelics in recovery out there. That mm -hmm. is a, uh, it's the, 12 step AA format, but psych, you, the use of psychedelics is not an outside, um, it's outside issue as in the regular 12 step recovery program. So if anyone mm -hmm. wants to learn more about that, you can shoot me an email. Um, mm -hmm. I have a couple groups I attend. There. Nice. Um, so Dr. Z, it is 1150. I know you are you have to go in a few minutes, but um, one more question and then I want sure. to some questions um, from the um, audience here. And thank you Great. all for submitting those questions. There's some good ones in there. Mm -hmm. um, if you could prescribe microdosing for any condition, what would it be and why? Uh, anything with a neurodegenerative component. So uh, Parkinson's, dementia, early cognitive decline, multiple sclerosis, ALS. Uh, that's where I would start. And also part of why I would do that is drug-drug interactions seem to be more forgivable at the microdose range. Individuals with those conditions tend to be on a number of other drugs already that might not make them candidates for taking a bigger dose of a psychedelic. Um, so for those folks, I would do microdose paired with uh, niacin, there it is again, mm -hmm. and uh, with some other kind of neurotropic, lion's mane is a very popular one. But yeah, that's the, that's the, the product we make has uh, a standard 100 milligram psilocybin with mm -hmm. lion's mane, turkey tail, cordyceps, reishi, chaga, agarcon, turmeric, sea moss, holy basil, brahmi, and... Uh, holy basil, 50 milligrams of niacin, and then 50 milligrams of magnesium three and eight. Oh, beautiful. And then we, oh, make, beautiful a, then we make a um, sister product that we call Minds Eye Harmonize uh -huh. without, without the, so the 100 milligrams in there. So uh -huh. you take them together. So when the um, psilocybin so wears off after three, four hours, you're not dipping. Mm -hmm. you're staying in that like oh, cool. amplified state of being and then on your days off you can take that as well when you're giving those receptors a little bit of a the cool. rest that they deserve and the neuroplasticity that they're working through um thanks justin for dropping that email in there okay mm -hmm. so um dr z thank you so much for for answering our questions that we yeah. came up with at medicine box um we could keep going on and on and on about these uh, these topics. Um, and uh, thank you for actually um, speaking uh, genuinely about kind of the, the dangers and things that we're seeing in the wider psychedelic space with, you know, the rise of narcissism and the psychedelic hucksters and the next, you know, money grab and big thing. So mm -hmm. um, pay attention who you work with, who you collaborate with, and then who you're, you know, handing your health over to as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, I think that's why legalization and decriminalization is going to be important. 
Yeah. Because if you're desperate to get better and the only person offering the treatment you want is someone who's a little bit of a mad hatter mm. and you're just so eager and ready to heal, that's your that's option. Patient. That's, right? the, that's yeah. the word. And yeah. it's unfortunate that we have to use that word like that, but that's the best yeah. one that yeah. we come up with. Um, okay, so uh, Savannah, um, any study on healing thyroid issues with psychedelics? That's a really interesting question, and it's one that I'm curious about. Um, and the answer is no, not that I'm aware of. Um, and what I will say is this. Here's what I've seen is thyroid let's trade out the word thyroid for any disease. If there is a psycho-spiritual component to the disease, then I am confident that the psychedelics will help that condition. Sometimes disease is really just in the body. Sometimes it's just that you're a flight attendant and you're exposed to a lot of radiation, right? Psychedelics right. aren't going to heal that one. Yeah. So um, but yeah, I am curious about that. I'll also say, here's the other thing I want to say about thyroid. Thank you so much for bringing it up. The number one most organic cause of depression is hypothyroidism. So another thing when you're working with addiction, not just addiction, but any condition, any mental health condition is, okay, maybe you want to have a psychedelic experience. Fair enough. Has anyone checked your thyroid? Has anyone made sure you're not anemic? Has anyone ruled out celiac disease? You know how many alcoholics have celiac disease and don't know it, mm. right? And those are things that psychedelics probably are not going to heal. Yeah. So making sure you're covering all your bases. Yeah, the psycho-spiritual component is huge. Um, my girlfriend has thyroid, a thyroid condition, and she just got Lyme's disease in oh, May. So and how uh, almost serendipitous, we were at a peyote ceremony in Nyack, New York. And it was like May and the grass was really tall. And mm. yeah, so. Um, I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah, she's working through it though. She, she's a trooper. Uh, I just want, this is just funny. December bark is, that is exactly why AA fails. He forgot to mention the LSD part. We need to bring that back in order for it to have a better success rate. Mm. Um, Bill did mention LSD, but it was his comrades that, put them down with the yep. abstinence model it was yeah. an outside issue rules um, someone asked about um, how to get in touch about a psychedelics and recovery meeting my calendar's on the in the chat there and i always like to take 30 minute calls with folks um, interested in this stuff um, let's see transcript of the meeting yes uh, there will be a recording of the video a transcript show notes we'll broadcast that back out uh, to the list. Um, what microdosing do anything for chronic pain? Maybe, maybe, uh, from the studies, for example, the Fatiman and Corb study, there was an incidental finding. This was people from across the world reporting their results, uh, seemed to help in particular with chronic pain after shingles with mm -hmm. migraines and, um, PMS was another incidental finding. Um, chronic pain often has a mental emotional component to it. Very often has a mental emotional component to it. And so I would feel confident that microdosing would be worth a try. Um, there's also an excellent podcast on chronic pain that I'm blanking on the name of right now. It was the woman, it was a woman who worked with John Sarno. First of all, if you haven't read No More Back Pain by John Sarno, just do, just do that. <laughs> just start there and if i find the podcast um brian i'll send you the link to share with okay. folks too. i need to read that book no more back pain mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the 36 years of skiing i've done mountain um, biking and hiking yeah um okay just i want to be very mindful of dr z here I, there's one more let's Actually, do it lightning uh, round uh brenda <laughs> i talked to brenda on uh the day before thanksgiving and she's in oklahoma mm -hmm. and uh -huh. She was with her little, I think her nieces, and they were making lemon meringue pie. And I said, if I could trade you lemon meringue pie for my microdosing products, I would, but you're so far away. Yeah. Uh, I love this <laughs> quote. Uh, thank you for posting this. It is no measure of health 
to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a great one. Mm -hmm. Getting to the root of the problem. Uh, it's not drugs, it's plant medicine. I call them medicines, they healed me. Uh, Luke said, what is everyone's thoughts on using the word drugs to describe psychedelics and cannabis? What is a better descriptor word? Do you have a better descriptor word for? You know, I use drugs and medicine interchangeably for plant medicines and Same. synthetic medicines because they're all both. <laughs> yeah, what's the, the only difference uh, between drugs and medicine is the dose, or, right? Or hmm. No, I think the only difference between drugs and medicine is your attitude. Like the word drug is not an inherently disparaging word. Drug it can be. It can be a it, right. Stores, right. It can be a weaponized word, but yeah. the word itself is not. Yeah. It doesn't have to have a negative connotation or a medical connotation. I think it's the context and how you're using it. Thank you for reframing that. Yeah. Even when I say drugs are like the drugstore, my dad would always say, you know, going down to the drugstore. He's, he's talking about like right, the, the, the pharmacy. Right? He's the pharmacy. Right. I'd be like, and oh, how funny right. that they sell cigarettes there. Yeah. <laughs> different way it's a drug they sell a drug yeah. i remember uh, one of my i used to live in boulder colorado and the one my dots diner is where i would have brunch all the time and there was a waitress who would come by with a pot of coffee and she would just say more drugs <laughs> <laughs> um one of my friends he'll re, uh, remain anonymous here but he's quite a jokester and he loves ketamine uh mm. the old um that song the Folgers coffee song the best part of waking up uh -huh, is uh -huh. Folgers in your cup his his version of that is the best part of waking up is drugs like, is drugs <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> he's a joke star. okay okay the world goes around because he's in it he, I love him I would uh, I would say breakfast but you know I would say breakfast I'm, but I'm I would say my, med my meditation is my the best part of me might come up but um, so I wanted to give accolades to someone here that wrote about alcohol. Uh, December bark is mushrooms have been healing my alcohol induced neuropathy as well. Good to hear that. Um, I well, just found the link to the podcast, so I'm okay. dropping it in the chat. Cool. And it's I can stay on everybody. Nicole while Sachs. Dr. Z goes on to her next. Are you treating patients or another webcast, podcast, research? I actually what are you doing? am. I have patients today. Yeah. Let's yeah. get Dr. Z off to her patients. <laughs> um, have some patience so she can get to her patients. I know. And I will happily stay on um, if anyone else wants to ask questions about the topics that we're exploring about products, about medicine box, about me, about um, recovery, anything. So um, I look forward to chatting with you again, as there's a lot more to talk about. And um, we will uh, send you all this beautiful content and the conversation that we just had. And Thank if you. there's anything else and um, any, any uh, closing comments for the, the audience or the last 30 days of um 2022 send us off you know the holiday season is upon us and this is a time of year where people tend to push alcohol on one another mm -hmm. alcohol is the only drug where if you're not using it people want you to explain why and i just want to remind everyone you don't owe anyone anything yep. you don't owe anyone an explanation you don't owe anyone a drink stay true to you stay healthy this holiday season Brian, you're still so you're still not drinking. Yeah, it's been ten years. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm I'm moving forward, not backwards. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, I I don't drink either. And and people are sometimes like, why don't you drink? And I just go, it doesn't bring me joy. Yeah. And that kind of just shuts down the conversation. It's like it, the the honest answer is, it's none of your business. Or like, I don't really want to go into it right now. But it's like, yeah, it doesn't bring me joy. Yeah. Like, oh, I just don't like how I feel when I do it. Yeah, is it like, spiritually expansive or spiritually constrictive? Is it also okay. a good question to ask yourself? And alcohol is very yeah. spiritually constrictive. Sure can be. In, in yeah. my in my experience, or 
another answer that I like to give is like, trust me, you don't want to see me drinking. You just don't. So yeah. that's why. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And so, so stay true to you this season. You've got this, this time of year is weird. And just it, it really is. Be, be gentle with yourself. Yeah. This time of year. Be gentle. That's it. Mm -hmm. Be kind, be compassionate, give yourself some love. So yeah. Um, well, from the bottom of my heart in Medicine Box and everyone else out there in the world, uh, I so appreciate you joining us today. It was uh, quite awesome. Thank you. It was really we, my packed, pleasure. we packed in a lot of good information and education in a very short amount of time and um, applaud you for doing the, the good work um, up there in Oregon and just really look forward to um, seeing all the beautiful work that you continue to do in the world. Thanks. Thanks, making, Brian. Yeah. And making an impact. Yeah. It was Brian. It was really just a pleasure to, to drop in and, and chat with you and yeah. uh, kudos on what you're doing too. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. All right. All right. Well, I guess uh, I'm going to sign off everybody. Um, make sure you copy paste those links in there that Alana um, posted and, Book a time with me if you want, even if you've talked to me before. I like talking with people. Um, our mini course is out. We're running that for $47 um, through the rest of the year. Uh, that has Dr. K on there, Dr. Karina, integrative and functional medicine doctor out of um, Santa Monica and Santa Fe. Uh, as well as Sean Merrick. He is in the Nevada City, uh, California area. I know someone, Brandy Navarro, was um, in Colfax. So that's really awesome education. It's a four-week um, do-it-yourself, do-it-at-your-own-pace pace, uh, modules, um, some cool exercises in there, as well as our uh, Mushroom Manifesto ebook, lots of great valuable information, clickable links, where to reach us, where to get products. And then um, our 90 day uh, bundle that we uh, had great success with uh, over the Black Friday, Cyber Monday um, holiday extravaganza sales event. Uh, but that contains uh, the two products that we I spoke with, I spoke about with Dr. Z. Um, it's the microdosing product with the, uh, nootropic and it's meant to be taken together on your days on and days off. That includes a diet, uh, with all very much cognitive enhancing, uh, food creations that are all plant-based, uh, a microdose tracker that's um, very analog where you can upload it into your good notes app or onto your iPad or tablet and keep track of your days on, days off, your concentration, your focus, um, setting intentions, taking notes. It's really fun to be able to track your journey um, through this process and see um, where you were at and where you're going and where you arrived, even though we never arrive at the destination. Um, so uh, you know where to find us and um, appreciate you all. And keep an eye out in your email as we'll be rebroadcasting this uh, probably I'd say after the weekend at latest, but um, we always rebroadcast the full recording, the transcription um, timestamps, if you want to skip through. And again, um, thank you for being accountable to your own uh, health and happiness and being curious to join us today. I appreciate all of you so much and all of your time and may the next 30 and a half days almost to the dot here um, of 2022 just be amazing awesome and full of joyful presence thanks